Last year in Marianne Bad, a landmark in the French New Wave, came out in Paris in October 1961. It was the second feature by the director Alain René, who had previously made Hiroshima Mon Amour in 1959, based on a script by the new novelist Marguerite Duras. Before that, René had made a number of documentaries, for example on Guernica, but also, and perhaps most famously, Night and Fog, Nuit et Brouillard, the film about the concentration camps. It's this interest in history and political events as well as his connection with literary figures in the movement of the nouveau roman, the new novel, which marks René out as a particular, as belonging to a section of the French New Wave that has been called the, the left bank New Wave, uh, along with directors like Chris Marker and um, Agnès Varda. However, Marianne Bad seemed to mark a departure from his previous work. The plot of Marianne Bad is mysterious and enigmatic. It's both impossible and very easy to summarize. It's about a man called X, who says that he had an affair the previous year with a woman called A, um, in Marianne Bad, or in a spa such as Marianne Bad. The woman, A, played by the beautiful star Delphine Serig, denies that the affair took place. She herself is with a man called M, who may or may not be her husband. And the action uh, takes place entirely within a beautiful Baroque palace and its formal gardens. And throughout the film, the characters wear formal evening dress. And we never know whether the affair took place. We never know the truth. It created an enormous and unprecedented amount of scandal in the press of the time. Many newspapers ran reviews, but they also ran in, uh, inquiries, uh, interviews with the filmmakers, and questionnaires. Uh, the Daily Le Monde, for example, ran um, uh, a set of questions to its readers and then published the results of the inquiry at the hu as a huge dossier uh, running over several pages. In an unprecedented move, uh, the cinema exhibitors had placards and even distributed leaflets to explain to the viewers that what they were about to see was uh, a revolutionary kind of film and that they shouldn't approach it in the, in the usual way. Um, generally speaking, the press was very favorable to the film, seeing it as a modernist masterpiece, although there were some dissenting voices that argued that it was, on the contrary, pretentious intellectual nonsense. And in a way, those uh, controversies have run um, to, to the present day. The film also um, fed into controversies about the role of the cinema of the ta at the time. Um, it was the period in the early 60s when attendances were declining quite considerably. And Marienbad became a kind of object to fight over uh, in relation to whether the cinema was losing its uh, connection to its popular roots, and also even whether it was uh, partly responsible for the decline in audiences. There were many reports of how people left the cinema in droves well, in, during the screenings of Marianne Bad. So it was, uh, in a way, a great success critically, but certainly not a box office uh, popular film. So what was the fuss all about? Um, was uh, Marianne Bad, as it was claimed, a modernist masterpiece, or was it indeed uh, fashionable nonsense? We may, first of all, look at the film in terms uh, precisely what it was doing uh, to challenge the conventions of filmmaking and of storytelling. It's a film which, of course, is based on uh, a script by a new novelist, and in many ways, it exemplifies the features of the new novel in its uh, challenge to or even attack on um, classical storytelling. Marianne Bad's challenge to classical storytelling may be seen as a series of refusals. First of all, there's a refusal of plot. We will never know if X and A met in a previous uh, encounter in Marianne Bad or indeed anywhere else. Uh, the, the film from beginning to end uh, is obscure in its plot um, and indeed at the time in interviews 
both Alain René, the director, and Alain Robbe-Grillet, the scriptwriter, offered different and conflicting interpretations of the plot and different interpretations of the ending. With a refusal of plot, very much in line with the new novel at the time, Marion Bad is evidence to a refusal of the stability of point of view. Not only is the plot obscure, but uh, the, narr the narrator, uh, who is in voiceover the character of X for most of the film, but not always, um, slowly emerges as an, an unstable and unbelievable narrator. Um, so that not only are we led down a series of mysteries and obscure encounters, but also we are not sure of the status of who is telling the story. So with, with, the, with the challenge to plot and narrative point of view comes a challenge to the very notion of character in Marian Bad. In, indeed, this is signaled by the fact that they don't even have names. Um, they are ciphers signaled by initials, X, A, and M. In fact, some critics has even, have even seen the characters in Marian Bad as already dead, as ghostly figures uh, moving around um, the, the palace of Marian Bad. Perhaps most conspicuously and most bafflingly is the refusal of chronology. The film we infer may be taking place in 1929, 1930, or 1931, but we don't know for sure. This is suggested by the look of the characters, by their clothes and their hairstyle, but there is no certainty about it. They could be in fancy dress. It's also the case that um, there are jumps in time in the film, and there may be flashbacks, but they're never signaled in any conventional way, so that the, the different layers of time that the film suggests are left um, to our imagination and, and are suggestive rather than something that we can, we can know for sure. Uh, indeed, this, the film has greatly interested a number of critics and historians in respect to its treatment of time, partly because this is a theme which attaches to the director, Alain René, um, who's always seen as uh, somebody who explores the notion of time. For the philosopher Gilles Deleuze, um, Marianne Bad, in fact, is the perfect embodiment of what he calls the time image, which is a kind of film in which the image itself embodies the notion of time, and as opposed to the movement image of, say, conventional action cinema. So th this uncertainty about time is acute in the film and, and, and is illustrated, for example, by the fact that According to the filmmakers, Marianne Bad could be taking place within five minutes or within a week, and, and we don't know. And the power of Marianne Bad is that it, on the one hand, powerfully evokes the notion of time and memory, and yet at the same time, and equally powerfully, completely challenges that notion. Perhaps last in this series of refusals is the refusal of naturalism. Marian Bad is a film which is set in extremely formal and, in a way, artificial theatrical setting. Uh, the palace of Marian Bad acts like a theater, almost, uh, one that is duplicated um, by, by an actual theater within uh, the palace, and we actually see the characters in the film watching a play. Uh, but the actors all act in, in, in a very stilted, deliberately artificial way. Um, wh one can look, for example, at the character played by Delphine Serig, the character of A, the way she, she gazes vacantly throughout most of the film, uh, laughs in a, in a very stilted way, um, but clearly deliberately. This is not a bad actress giving a bad performance. This is a good actress giving a bad performance deliberately to break the illusion of naturalism. With all these uh, different challenges to conventional, to classical storytelling, Marian Bad, one might say, exists in the space of its own storytelling. And this is certainly the kind of interpretation that um, the filmmakers and, and critics at the time uh, put forward uh, predominantly. Its plot is the film but not in terms of a conventional plot, which we can have the explanation of, but in terms of the pleasure in plotting itself. Indeed, Marion Bad can be seen as a game. It, it's a puzzle, 
and it's a game which which is itself represented within the film by the very conspicuous games that the characters themselves play. There's a famous uh, game of mas matchsticks uh, and cards which they played, which sort of became very popular at the time, so people began to emulate the characters in the play, in the film itself. Um, so so it's, it's a puzzle, it's a game, and, and the pleasure is not in finding the solution to the puzzle, but it's in playing the game. As well as a puzzle and a game, Marion Bad is also a mise en abîme, that is to say, a set of repeated mirror images that play off each other, for example, uh, between the film itself and the play within the film, which, as in Shakespeare, acts as a, a kind of repeated image of what the film is doing. Um, and But finally, it is also, um, as, as many have argued, um, the, the structure of its plot is also that of a dream, that th there's a sense of the dreamlike in the repetitions uh, the kind of incantations one has in the film, the displacements, the, the, the condensation. So, so, and the, the, the slightly nightmarish sense of repetition, which is itself part of the plot, where the character is doing the same last year in Marion Bad, is, is indeed the structure of dreams and is, is the structure of the film itself. Now, while Marion Bad has been predominantly seen in the formalist terms that I have just been talking about. In other words, as a film which is purely concerned with form and with no reference to the outside world, other interpretations are possible. The first one is that the film could be seen as a fable for the nuclear age. This is indeed how a number of critics saw it at the time. Like the films of Antonioni, of Bergman, of Goddard to some extent, Marian Bad uh, belongs to that um, trend in early 60s cinema, which uh, reflects in very oblique and formalist terms on uh, the anxieties of the modernist age, and in particular, the anxieties caused by the age of the nuclear bomb. And this is read in the film in terms of the, uh, the kind of ghostly figures, the way in which the characters seem to be frozen in a kind of eternal afterlife. A second type of interpretation for Marion Bad, which goes beyond the formal aspect of the film, is one that has to do with love, in inverted commas, or perhaps more specifically sexuality. At the time, uh, a number of people saw the film uh, as the story of persuasion, as a story about the uncertainties of love, in the way the character of X tries to convince A that they had um, an affair in the previous year in Marienbad. Now, more recently, some uh, feminist scholars have looked closely at the text and have, in particular, unearthed the significance of the play within the film, which uh, had tended to be um, ignored in previous accounts. Now, the play that we see um, a, a poster for in Marienbad, and also which we actually see characters attending and we also see actors on stage, is a play called Rosmer, which is a shortened version of the name of a play by Ibsen. And in that play, very interestingly, although this is not something that is immediately obvious when, when watching the film, in that play, two characters, a man and a woman, um, have conflicting views of what happened in the past. And the past has to do with repressed sexuality and even the intimation of sexual violence, of rape. Now, it is then possible to see Marian Bad in relation to this interpretation, that um, in this particular reading, uh, the, if, we, if we accept this interpretation, uh, the reluctance of A to, um, to go along with X interpretation could be seen as a, a kind of denial, something that comes out of repression of a traumatic event, which could or could could be uh, rape or could be some kind of sexual violence. And there is a sense that rather than refusing his interpretation, she is actually resisting it, uh, which, which gives credence to this particular interpretation. It, so in this interpretation, um, A's reluctance to accept X's version of events, um, her sudden flashes of memory, her obvious distress, especially as she goes near the bedroom in which supposedly the affair took place, 
therefore speaks of uh, the, 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 the reluctance to accept the resistance to something that was especially traumatic. And the story of persuasion that X uses towards A then could be seen as a way of talking about the trauma uh, in a way, and yet at the same time, the, the fact that the film cannot openly acknowledge that trauma. Finally, a third layer of interpretation is that the film, far from being a kind of cold intellectual game that many people saw it as being, as reflected in the games played by the characters in the film, um, it is actually a film that is awash with emotion. And interestingly, um, at the time, a number of uh, critics wrote that one should not try and interpret the film, one should be swept along uh, by the emotion of the film. And uh, more recently, uh, Gilles Deleuze himself has argued that Marianne Bad is, is a film in which uh, Alain René goes beyond character towards feelings and emotions. In the end, the impossibility of fixing the meaning of Marianne Bad may be what it's all about. Marianne Bad, like a number of art films of the early 60s, is a film that cultivates mystery. And in that sense, it's a supreme example of that kind of filmmaking, like the films of Buñuel or Antonioni of the period. But what is very tangible in the film and unarguable, and which we haven't said anything about so far, is the mise en scène, is the beauty of the images. Marianne Bad is absolutely remarkable for its use of black and white photography. In, in what has become the kind of trademark of René's mise en scène, namely long, gliding, smooth tracking shots. The film opens uh, in an absolutely um, stupefying way with a very, very long tracking shot along the corridors and the ceilings of Marienbad. And uh, it's that, that photography, the glamour of that black and white photography, which in a way has continued to make the film appear cool in inverted commas and so cool that um, even um, pop videos like that for Blur song to the end have pastiched Marianne Bad. It, it's a kind of filmmaking which has remained uh, fashionable even today. I think uh, Marianne Bad, um, what one could say is the perfect example of a, of a landmark classic film because it's both, it's very much a film of its time as, as we've discussed in a number of ways whether it's about the nuclear age, whether it's about the formalism and the attempt to recreate um, the, the literary experimentation of the new nouveau roman, the new novel in film, but at the same time it's also um, universal and eternal and, and, it, and it manages, it's sort of timeless in, in, in other ways and it's that timelessness that has meant that it, we can still uh, watch it today. And um, if at the time critics were saying, well, don't try and resist the film, don't try and look for interpretation, just be swept along, then watch Marianne Bad and be swept along.